Today, we continue with David's story. To warn you, some details in this interview are distressing and of an adult nature. I was taken to, it seemed like a, an apartment somewhere, and it was either near Westminster or Whitehall. Um, they were celebrating the fact that Margaret Thatcher had been elected leader of the Conservative Party on the 11th of February. I was led into um, this large room, and there was maybe 20, 25 people there. And, um, How many MPs were there, or politicians? Or? There were certainly four or five politicians that I knew, and I was introduced to them. I mean, there, was, there wasn't any secrecy about it. It was all very open, and, and I just felt completely abandoned. Now, I have to say that there were other younger people there as well. There would have been boys from maybe about 15 up to my age, maybe um, five, six or seven of them. But did but it they feel seemed, strange well, having those boys there and these politicians? Well, the difference was the younger people seemed to be entering into the spirit of things. You know, they were actually there to party. And, you know, I seen uh, we're passing around uh, various drugs and tablets. But there was there were a couple of tables and there was a whole array of drinks, you know, champagne, um, wine, beers. Did you were you told what was going to be expected of you at uh, this party? Nothing. At all. You not. were told nothing about absolutely it. No told information. Nothing about the party at all. Um, um, but I had a fair idea that it wasn't going to end um, pleasantly for me. There was a lot of banter going on between people. Do you remember what they were saying? Well, some of them were talking about um, the resurgence of the Conservative Party. They were talking about the election of Thatcher. But having said that, some of the people who were there were actually joking about Thatcher and making some uh, very negative comments about her. You know, some of them were saying, you know, I fought in the war, I did this, I did that, and now we have a bloody woman in charge of the party. The double doors were closed at one stage then and the curtains were drawn over it and then some of the boys started to become quite intimate with some of the older men, kissing, um, you know, um, performing oral sex. It was just uh, like a scene from hell for me. I um, one, of, one of the politicians started performing oral sex on me and then another much older politician um, was encouraged to do the same thing. Then I was made to kneel down in front of them and perform oral sex on them. Um, and at that stage, I was just totally humiliated. So from that really it started. I was drawn into this web where I would have been uh, taken to various parties. Um, I would have been uh, meeting individuals for sex uh, and just was totally trapped. Did you ever have experience of going to Dolphin Square where people have said there were such parties that you're yes, talking well, about? I had attended one very small party. I mean, I was picked up um, on one evening and the guy that left me at a location said to the driver, take him to the Dolphin. And I assumed I was being taken to a pub, that I would then be transferred somewhere else. Um, but it turned out that we were taken to, a, you know, it was a big um, complex, a big block of flats. Um, it was quite a small apartment, maybe one, maybe two bedrooms. There were a couple of elderly military people there, and there was young one young guy from the military who would have been my age, 20. And then there was a rent boy, so there was three of us. And we were made to sit on a settee and perform oral sex on each other. This was being filmed at the time. And then we were um, we had to have sex with the other um, clients who were there. There, were, there would have been photographs taken. But, I mean, I've been doing a lot of writing and research about this. And I've seen a series of photographs and seen that a young man on the left-hand side of one of these photographs was me. So it was rather disconcerting to see yourself... Um, from 40 years ago performing sex and that this is available on the internet and I've given these photographs to the Met you as have, well they so have the, oh they, they have, have them they have them yeah and that was in Dolphin Square was yes, it yes that was in Dolphin Square are you certain when I look at the photographs and see the other two guys on the settee beside me I am associating that with Dolphin Square at this point I asked David if he can show me the photos this is me this would have been maybe a year or um 18 months before I went to London. So these were just taken at the time. Yeah. And then that would have been shortly before I went to London, those two. And then within weeks, we sort of progress. It's all right. To this. They're quite explicit photos, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, shocking. And even looking at this one, I, I mean, I know looking at that that I'm quite spaced and out of it. You know, just have a far away look. So there was, you know, drink and drugs involved here. So, uh, 
This is the guy that I was telling you was a member of the military. And the other guy over on the other side was a rent boy. So <laughs> that wasn't within weeks of arriving. Yeah. It takes a few moments for David to recover. It may appear odd to search the internet for explicit photos of yourself, and I asked Dave Marshall, the former head of the Met paedophile unit, about it. They are explicit and very upsetting photographs for him, yeah. and um, as far mm. as we can tell, it probably is him. We can't be certain. Mm. We can't be certain. But... Um, I mean, what, what I find is that victims want to believe, be believed, and that's one of the key things. They just want to be believed. And people say, well, where's the proof? So they go looking for the, for the proof. Well, here's evidence of it. And perpetrators do record their abuse. That is one of the advantages in, his, well, in any case, is that search for the evidence for those jigsaw puzzle pieces that paedophiles do keep documents, recordings of their abuse, and you're able then to use that to corroborate the, the victim's account. But it's, again, very resource-intensive, time-consuming a process, looking for that needle in the haystack. We're now coming to the most disturbing part of David's testimony about the sexual abuse of young children. There were three occasions when I saw younger boys. There was a house party in Essex, and when I was being taken upstairs and led into one of the bedrooms, a man appeared down the corridor and he was leading a 12-year-old boy there. And, um, I mean, as, until the day I die, I will never forget the expression on that young man's face. And I tried to look reassuringly at him in some ways to try and give him something that resembled a smile. Um, but I just saw the expression of fear and terror as he was led past me into a bedroom and I was just pushed forward into a room and felt totally helpless. Did you see him again? No, no, I never saw him after that. Um, there was another occasion I was being transported to a party and there was, a, again, a young boy. He would have been in his, maybe, you know, again, between 10 and 12, 13. He was made to perform oral sex on a car that I was being transported in. I was dropped off and then he was taken somewhere else. And then there was one further occasion when I was taken to an apartment in Notting Hill and there were two brothers, aged 8 and 10, who were being sexually tortured. And I tried to intervene and was beaten unconscious. What was happening to them? I you can't talk about can't it. Can't really talk about it. I mean, it was just appalling sexual abuse. Unbelievable sexual abuse. And you tried to intervene. What did I you do? You just well, I, I mean, this, this evening started off where I was taken to a restaurant and was told that I would be going to see the best show in London that night. Um, and we were taken there and it was, um, you know, a very hushed, quiet, large room as the tea had been put against um, a wall. And there were a group of men sitting around and standing around having drinks. And um, these two boys, I was told they were brothers, aged eight and ten, um, were brought out and they had little like bathrobes on. And they were obviously drugged. And one of the men went over and... Um, got the two boys to perform sex acts on each other um, and then it progressed and they a much more serious sexual assault and I at that stage just sprang out of the chair and called them all sick bastards and tried to intervene but at that stage I just got you know a kick in the back and um, fell to my knees and a few slaps across the face my nose was bleeding um, and then I just turned on their frenzy you know I was being sexually attacked and um, two groups of men descended like vultures on these two boys. There are very few of them that would have been involved with what you might call young children, you know, under the age of 15. Yes. But there were some of them. Peter Wrighton and Peter Heyman, they were directly, I've seen them, abuse young children. And the rest of them would have been involved with rent boys from about 15 up to, you know, my age, 20. Peter Wrighton, who died in 2007, was a social work expert and a member of the Paedophile Information Exchange, a group which tried to decriminalise sex between children and adults. He was convicted of importing child abuse images in 1992. 
In 1981, Sir Peter Heyman, a former diplomat, was named in Parliament after police investigated him for sending and receiving pornographic material through the Royal Mail. He was also a member of the Paedophile Information Exchange and was later fined after being found guilty of an act of gross indecency with a man. He died in 1992. I played that part of the interview to Dave Marshall, the former Detective Chief Inspector with the Met. Does that ring true to you as well? I mean, is that something that you've ever come across? I mean, is that typical of what, what happened? The scenario of a group of men coming together and younger boys being brought into their company and then sexually abused is very believable and I've come across such scenarios, so that's entirely believable. There are only, he says, eight and ten. Well, I can, I can, I can believe that. It was very shocking to hear it's quite hard um, for us to take in that kind of abuse. And so we kind of want to just push it away and, and turn off the radio or, you know, just not hear it, not I listen. Think you think it's bad to listen to it. What's it like when it's actually happening to you, when you are that young child being, being abused? So if it is tough, it's a lot tougher for the, for the, actual, for the actual, for the victims. And Dave had another question. Why didn't David call the police? That's something I'd already asked him. When you had seen that abuse of very young boys, did you not feel you should go to the police? And why didn't you go to the police? Yeah, I mean, at, at that time, I was absolutely um, terrified. I just felt completely trapped and that they had a complete hold over me. Um, you know, they had made threats about me being framed for the murder of a policeman. They talked about that would be easy for them to implicate me in that. They talked about um, photographs that had been taken of me that would be sent to my family. They had talked about, you know, threatening actual harm to members of my family. So I, I just felt completely trapped and um, helpless, totally helpless. Do you think they're accurate, the stories then, that there was some kind of paedophile ring? Or was it just a group of these politicians and fairly influential people who, yeah. who who were involved. It wasn't sort of an organised thing. Yeah, I mean, I think, to be honest, there, there needed to be of some type of organisation behind this. You know, there were two or three different organisations that um, the same individuals were associated with. I met people like Peter Heyman, Peter Wrighton, and some other individuals who were then in the process of setting up what they were calling the Pedophile Information Exchange. Now, some of the individuals there were involved in an organisation called the National Association for Freedom. So even in that sense, from an organisational level, there was networking. But, I mean, there must have been lots of other people that knew about it. I mean, even setting aside the people who were directly involved in the abuse, there were lots of other people who must have known, you know, the Mr. Fixers, if you like, the people who would have made bookings, the people who drove cars. You know, one of the things that occurs to me, because I would have visited hotels in London, uh, the Savoy, the Dorchester, the Carlton Club, the Guards Club, and when I arrived at these places, doors mysteriously opened and visitors' books mysteriously closed, and I almost would have glided through to the bar or two bedrooms. So that just doesn't happen by its own. There needs to be some something behind it, some type of organisation. Did part of you think, wow, here am I associating with people who seem yeah. to be so smart and yeah. know so many people? There, that's a good question. There was another dimension to this, of course. I mean, I was mixing in with some very, very important people. And there was actually a part of me that, I mean, I actually did admire these people. I would have thought, well, wow, why couldn't I have had a father that would have been such a high achiever and achieved so much and were fabulously wealthy. So I was exposed to all this wealth and I was getting, you know, I would have been being given two or three hundred pound a week, which was a fortune in those days. But the ironic thing is I never had an opportunity to spend the money. I just felt used like a product. And I was just passed around London on almost an industrial scale for eight weeks. And in some ways, you know, I got through it because I drank so much at night and took tablets that he didn't care anymore. He just got through it. And it was almost like you were playing a role. You know, when I walked into some of these champagne receptions and art galleries and was introduced to these people and I would have been allocated a companion for the night, it was almost like you were acting in a film, like a movie role. I've been 